Hey, South Hills. Today, I just want to take a moment and celebrate what God has been doing with our church. About a year ago, we launched South Hills Manhattan Beach, and uh, it was the beginning of a journey of when God only knew what was going to come. And so we went from eight people to the start of this Manhattan Beach campus to 375 on their <laughs> one year anniversary. And I want to give Brian an opportunity to share a little bit of the wins that have been happening in the last year. It's been pretty incredible. I, I, I'm I'm just thinking of all the families that I've talked to that have invited somebody from their family that have never been to church. Really the key factor right now is the community that's happening outside the building. Everybody sticks around in the conversations that are happening. You'll see a table of two families and they're two families that don't know each other. They don't, they're not friends, they didn't come together. They just sat down at a table, another family ended up sitting there and they have this conversation that turns into a relationship. I'm thinking of the people who've been baptized and we've had two little ones that were both eight years old. I was baptized when I was eight years old. Mm. And when I saw these little ones that wanted to be baptized, it just reminded me of all the amazing things that God has done in my life, but that he's gonna do in their lives. I mean, I can't tell you how many families have shared that their kids just never want to leave. We're finding so many that were not raised in church and their kids are just so bought in. They're like, this is just amazing. Like my family has a church that every one of us from the littlest one, uh, you know, to me and my wife or whatever it might be, that they're all experiencing church together. Mm. And I, I think that's what we're called to do. These are stories we hear at all of our campuses, but it has been unreal to see what God has been doing through South Hills Manhattan Beach. So South Hills Manhattan Beach, a huge shout out to you. All of our campuses today are selling rating you. Today at South Hills, we're starting a new series called I Need a Vocation. Someone once said, work is a necessary evil to be avoided. And if we're uh, honest, we've all uttered similar things at some point, right? It's Sunday night, you're having dinner with your family, it's 9 o'clock, and you're like, ah, do I really have to go to work tomorrow? Can I just call in sick? How many thought about that once? You guys are at church, what's going on? You know, I, I know I thought about it. Or what about like, like, oh my God, tomorrow is Monday. I'm dreading all these meetings. I don't want to go to work. I hate my job. Can I just avoid it? Am I destined to work here for like forever? How about if I just like quit and just call in sick and never show up again? I felt like that at one point in my life. It was about five years ago. Um, when I wasn't a full-time pastor, in fact, I wasn't a pastor. I remember um, at a company here called uh, Polymer Logistics, I was the uh, logistics like supervisor. I was the newbie. Anybody been a newbie in the company? That's right. Um, and the newbies usually work during the holidays, right? Well, who's gonna work? Who's new? You're working. And I remember it was Christmas Eve. Yeah, Christmas Eve, I had to work, um, and it was 1 p.m. You know, my family was at home prepping the tamales. Any tamale lovers in here? All right, awesome. You guys are, are yes, we are, we're connecting, we're connecting. Uh, they had tamales and everything, um, and I was at work, and um, I love what I do. I actually love wh what I did before, and I was working, and I got this call from a nasty customer. It's like, he was so mad. Is this Ozzy? Yes. What are you doing? Like, whoa, 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 who's this? And my name is this. I'm from this customer. I'm like, oh, no. Sir, give me five minutes. Let me check on your load. I'm not sure where the trucker is at, but I'll call him. And I called the trucker like 10 times. He never answered. And I was going crazy. And that guy called me again. Are you Ozzy? Because he's from like the East Coast and he had that accent, right? Are you Ozzy? Yes. Where's my load at? And I'm all, sir, I don't know. It's Christmas Eve. I'm a newbie. Please be gentle with me. 
I'm going to call your boss. I'm going to like, go ahead and call him. Wait, which one? The owner or the founder of the company? The founder of the company. Wait, he's in Israel. Yes, I'm going to wake him up and tell him that you're doing a horrible job. And I was new. Like, sir, you really are going to do that? Yes, I'm going to wake him up right now. In fact, I'm going to call the CEO of the company, and he, he's in New York. And I'm wait, it's Christmas Eve. And then he told me this, where's my truck? Where's my load? I need it because I need to deliver a load tomorrow. You're incompetent. You, this is a colossal mistake. I'll never forget that day because when he was screaming at me, I'm all like, do I really need this job? I hate my job. The only thing that saved that day is I left from work and my family had tamales for me. And my family was there and my kids were there. And I honestly love what I did. I, I, back then, I used to ship crates to growers. The growers put the uh, vegetables or the fruit in their crates, and then they s- ship them to Walmart or Stater Brothers. And when you go into the groceries, uh, when, you, when you see any black or, uh, or brown crates, um, those are us. You pick from those crates. And, and that's what we did. We send them to the, 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 the growers. And I, I loved my job. I really liked what I did. And, and uh, the next day, I had a day off. And, and the next day, I went to work like, oh, I hope this never happens again. I love my job again. I'm all good. I'm all good. And, and we've all been there, right? We've all tried to awor- avoid work as much as possible. Or some can't even wait for vacation to come. Or some really, like, really love being at work. Which, you're weird. See, our culture has a complicated relationship with work. We know people who hate their jobs. They absolutely dread it. They're in a bad mood when they go in, and they're in a bad mood when they leave work. They complain about it constantly. I know it's a, it's a means to an end, but for them, they just want to get paid, leave work, and go do something they really, really like. And then we also know people who want these jobs where it doesn't feel like a job. They want a, a work that doesn't feel work. Oh, I'll do anything as long as it's fun all the time. As long as it has all these like perks. I'll do anything as long as nobody tells me what to do. As long as there's no expectations. Ever met anybody that has like a, a low-end job that you would never want? But they're super happy. They don't get raises. They don't get promotions. It's not a job you want, but your friend, your family member, ooh, they love it. See, we have a a complicated relationship with work. Here's what's interesting. The Word of God presents a picture of work that's very different from our culture. Scriptures begin with God working at building a paradise building Garden of Eden, building this, this earth, this world. And he put people in it. And he didn't give them a pina colada, hey, drink this, and chill. He didn't say, hey, here's the jet ski. Woo, enjoy yourself. You know what he did? He built all that, and he put them to work. That's amazing. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28 says this. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish. Say rule. Uh, Like rule. One, two, three. Rule. There you go. That's better. Over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. What did God do? And said to them, be fruitful, increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So keep this in mind. Right now there is a sinless environment. Everything is perfect. And he instructs the men to work. Now the question is, what kind of work? He says, be fruitful, subdue, and reign. Follow me. That's 
their job description. That is their work description. Essentially, God is saying, he presents people an incomplete creation and says, hey, let's make something better out of all this, all these raw materials. I left this job unfinished because I want to partner with you. And he says, be fruitful. First of all, have babies. Have families. Grow. See, God wants to see more of us, not less of us. Not depopulate, but populate. Because I blessed you. And he says, subdue. While everything that God created was good, it was still undeveloped and untapped. He says, cultivate it, work it, bring it under your control, dominate. And don't be dominated. He says, rule. Ruling should be seen as stewardship. God owns the world, but he has put it under our control to care for it, to cultivate it. And then God says, oh my God, I'm so smart. I'm super excited. I can't wait to see what I created. I can't wait to see him at work. So watch what he does. Genesis chapter two, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it. To what? To work it and take care of it. So the biblical theology of work is that work was designed by God as a man's earthly occupation to make the earth better. God said to Adam, hey, Adam, channel the creativity you have through this occupation. I'm going to put you here. Channel all your skills, subdue, rule, cultivate, make it better for your wife and for all those people that will come after you. See, work is channeling your creativity, effort, and energy into helping humanity thrive and flourish on earth. Work was a part of God's plan from the beginning. And doing this regularly makes life more meaningful, enjoyable, and fulfilling. How does it feel when we don't have work? We're desperate. We're like, oh my God, I need to be doing something. But when you get work, you're like, oh yeah, I got a job, I got It's meaningful, it's enjoyable, it's fulfilling. See, work isn't a necessary evil. It's a necessary good. Work isn't a necessary evil, it's a necessary good. So much that God even worked. He was planting and tending to the garden. He was hand-making humans. He made you guys, that's why you guys look so beautiful from up here. He was sculpting you guys. He was doing all the grunt work, the dirty work, everyday work. He was sweating. He, he did exhausted manual labor when he created everything. Maybe this isn't what you imagine about God. But this is what he is willing to do to help humanity be better, to flourish, no matter how small, simple, mundane, dirty, challenging, lowly, unseen it was. He did it because he wants to see humanity better. He did it because he loved what he did, and he enjoyed it. Everybody say, enjoyed it. He enjoyed his job. Now, this raises a question for all of us. If according to God, work is good and a blessing then why doesn't it seem like it? Especially on Sunday night. It seems like it's a curse rather than a blessing. See, even when our our job is making the world better, even when we reach our goals at our job, we still don't love every minute of it. It's still stressful. It's exhausting. It's annoying. If work is blessed by God, then why doesn't it feel like it? It's because there's more to the story. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 to 19, it says this. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. 
Cursed is the ground. I'll say it again. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. Verse 18. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. Verse 19. By the sweat of your bro, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Meaning when we pass, when we die. It says, from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. So, Eden, working in Eden was designed to be pleasant and rewarding, a rewarding occupation for Adam. He had his piña colada. He had everything right there on Eve. He was working. I imagine him caring for all the plants, being focused, passion, so much energy at what he was doing in the garden. But sin changed everything. In the same way, sin affects our relationship, our health, our planet, our spiritual life. Work also feels the effects of sin. But here, follow me. God never cursed men. He never said, Adam, ooh, you are cursed, son. In fact, he never cursed work. He cursed the ground. So, God did curse the ground, which means Adam was not going to produce in the same way he used to produce. See, sin only made work more difficult. In other words, God is saying, hey, your work, Adam, which used to be easy, now will be more painful. Your work will sometimes cause conflict, cause envy, fatigue. You're going to sweat. You're going to get sore. Work is not cursed. It's just going to cost you more. You're going to feel tired. Anybody feel tired when you go to work and come back? You could think Adam and Eve. You're going to feel tired, maybe even disengaged. It's going to be a struggle. Results at your job won't come easy. You're going to want to quit. You're going to have butterflies and your stomach's going to get all hard when you go into meetings. To a point where you feel it's a curse, but God is saying it's not a curse. It's the result of sin, but keep working, keep pushing. I will still bless you. And the question is this, when it comes to work, how do you experience more of the blessing and less of the curse in your day-to-day life? Is it possible to hate your job? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Eve. Imagine. Think about how many hours we spend at work. In fact, we spend more hours at work than at home. Some work 40 hours a week. Some work 50 to 80 hours a week. I mean, how many hours of that is in our lifetime? I mean, how many hours do you work? Some work 90 hours a week. If you're going to spend so many hours at work then nobody should hate their job. But in case you do, ask yourself this. If you have an occupation, a job you don't like, ask yourself this. Would God do this work? If so, how would he do it? No matter what you do, Ask yourself, would God do this? How would he do this? Well, let's go back and look at what God did when he created all this. God worked in the heavens and earth, took a step back. He said, wow, it's good. We went back. What? He, he, he said, hey, let there be light. Took a step back, said, woo, this is good. He separated the waters, the ground. He said, oh, I'm liking it even more. It looks good from here. Then he, said, he started doing the vegetation and the trees and everything. He took a step back. He's all like, oh, boy, I'm good. And then went back. And what did he do? He started doing all the creatures and all that. He took a step back. And he said, like, wow, let's add some dinosaurs here. Oh, no. Dinosaurs, don't they get it? No. God worked. And always took a step back. Every time he did something, he finished and says, wow, this is very good. 
I'm proud of this. I'm proud of the contribution I did with all this to make it better for Adam, for Eve, and for everybody that's coming. Isn't this what we're all trying to do? Be proud, contribute, make life, this world better? What if you step back at your job and adjust your framework and adjust the way you look at your job? Even though you might not make a lot of money, it's all good, you're still my friend. You might have a job that it's not ultra prestigious. You might not have the job that your grandparents want you to have. Even though there are things about your job, those, the, the environment is not good, you don't love. But what if you adjust, you take a step back and say, what would I do different? What book do I need to read to change? How can I adapt to my job? Do you need to take, take a step back and say, you know what? I have a job. I am blessed, and I'm very good at this because I am partnering with God to cultivate creation. I am tapping into something that is untapped. That's why you're there. But then we have questions like this. What if I'm stuck in a job I hate? My worst schedule, oh man, is slowly killing me. What if I can see how my work benefits others and supports, you know, the world? Well, this is why you need to come the rest of the Sundays. Because we're going to talk about all this through the month of June. See, these are all questions we continue to look at. But for today, the most important thing we can hold on as we make our way through this series and our life is that God worked. And we were made in his image to work. Everybody say work. So God shows up in the Old Testament. He creates everything. He's a gardener. He starts working. Now, that brings up a question. If God worked, what did Jesus do? Let's check it out. John chapter 5 verse 17 says this. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at work to this very day. And I too am working. Whoa. Jesus also hustled. Jesus also worked. See, Jesus raises the stakes, right? He raises the stakes even further. He claims not only that his father worked, but that he too is working. It was understandable, you know, if the son of God had spent his time in the temple, reading scriptures, teaching people about the Bible, preaching, healing. But for the first 30 years of his life, guys, guess what he did? He hustled. He worked. He was a carpenter. So he made money. He was a carpenter. So he saw a tree. And he says, wow. Let me make some chairs out of that tree. It's probably the wooden chairs you have at home or something. He was creative. He was skilled. He invented something. He ruled. He subdued. And then he said, oh, that chair, that wooden chair looks nice for that tree. I'm going to get this other tree over here, and I'm going to make a table for it. And now we have outdoor furniture. What? What if? What if? He saw a tree, and he says, this is a tree. I'm going to make my own cross, or they're going to crucify me on it. Because it was made out of wood. He worked. He wasn't. Sitting at home, watching Netflix. He enjoyed every minute of it. If Jesus worked, then it's not good for men to be without work. If you have no job, then we'll pray for you to get a job. So you can partner with God and say, hey, God, how can I partner with you to create and cultivate and make this world better? But what if you do have a job and you hate it? What is God telling you this morning? He's telling you this. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses verses 22, it says this. So I perceive that there was nothing better. I love this part. Can we put the verse up here? 
It says, so I perceived, there it is. So I perceived that there was nothing better, what, what, no, nothing what? Again, it's nothing what? <laughs> nothing better for human beings. Whoa, watch out. But to enjoy what they do because that's what they were, that's what they're allowed it in life. What? Well, let me read that again. I'll read it this way because maybe that TV's off. So I perceive that there was nothing better for humans than to enjoy what they're allotted in life. I mean, who is really able to see what would happen in the future? Because I don't know what's going to happen in the future. I'm going to enjoy, enjoy my job now. Because I don't know what's going to happen in a week, a year, tonight. I'm going to enjoy what I have right now. According to God, there is nothing better for you to enjoy your occupation, your job. And maybe we didn't enjoy it because we forgot that our job description is to subdue, rule, cultivate, and make our occupation better. Maybe your boss is not your boss. Maybe your boss is God. We are a culture that complains, right? We are a culture that thinks our job is evil. And when we complain, we turn God's blessing into a sin. We don't reach those blessings because we complain and we complain and we complain. God says, enjoy your job. Enjoy your occupation. There's nothing better than for human beings to enjoy. What does that mean? You wake up Monday morning with your coffee and you're like, I'm going to my job because I love it. That was kind of loud, right? You dress for success, if you want to put it that way. You're going into your cubicle, and you're excited, and you're talking to yourself. I'm going to go to my job because this is the occupation that God gave me, and I'm going to cultivate, I'm going to dominate, I'm going to subdue, I'm going to rule. Woo! And that's how raises come. Whether it's a small job or a big job, you're going to be focused. You're not going to be the one gossiping. You're not going to be the one arriving late because you enjoy it. But, you know, there's a lot of people that go, to, they, they go in at work at 8, woo, and they're already checking their clock to see if it's 4 p.m. Whoa. If you enjoy it, you wouldn't even check your watch. If you appreciate your job, you wouldn't check. You don't, you don't even want to take lunch. Because you want to be there. God says, hey, enjoy it. Cultivate, do something new. At your job, there's something on tap that will get you that promotion. See, I think God is checking our attitudes when we go to work. Whether you're a CEO, whether you're a manager, a supervisor, whether you own a landscaping company or you don't, whether you drive one of those ice cream trucks or you don't, you enjoy it not because of what you expect out of your job. It's only a means to an end. You enjoy it because God gives you the wisdom, the strength, and is partnering to, with you. And he says, hey, cultivate it. Do something new with it. God doesn't call you an employee. He calls you co creator Your work is not cursed to hate. Your work is a gift from God to enjoy. He chose you to manage, to cultivate, to rule, to subdue this earth. Imagine if we go in tomorrow with that mentality. Your boss is going to be like, whoa, who's this? Wow. Where were you at like yesterday, last week? I need this you. Imagine if we arrive to work with this mindset. And this is how we fully embrace who we, who were, we created to be. When you start looking at work this way, you'll see yourself differently. You'll see God differently. When you start seeing the world this way, everything else is going to look different. For example, this morning, 
You drove by the freeway, and there was somebody repairing the road. You'll say, I'm grateful for that guy. Because, because of him, my car doesn't go, on, doesn't go on those holes in the street. You know, my, my, my tires are threading nicely because that guy repaired the road. I'm grateful for him. I'm grateful for that guy that last time I went to Chipotles and I said extra chicken. And boy, he knows what extra chicken means. He put that extra cup of chicken or, 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 or spoon of chicken. He knows how to do his job. My lunch was super because of him. He's doing his job. I'm grateful for the landscaper that makes my house look beautiful. I'm thankful for the landscaper that makes God's earth look so green and beautiful. He's, he's, he's using his skills, his occupation to make everyone else better, even your house. What if we go around and, and, and we look at the world that way? You know what I'm thankful for? I'm thankful for mechanics. Oh, because one of my, uh, like, shortcomings and my uh, 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 things that get me down and my weaknesses, if my car comes out with a check engine light, that's it. I'm, it's over for me. I get mad. I get frustrated. I get stressed. Everything. I'm like, wait, oh, I have a friend that's a mechanic, and he's good. He's using his skills to make my life better. Bless him. What if we go around the world thinking that way, that he's partnering up with God, just like you're partnering up with God to make your job better and to make this world better. What about all those stay-at-home moms? Yeah, you guys could go ahead and clap. I mean, <laughs> what about all these stay-at-home moms that stay home, take care of our kids, cook, Make sure the house is clean so when the husband comes in, there's food, the house is clean. Uh, deal with our kids, the stress, everything. They make our life better. They make our home better. They make our world better. Bless them. So here's my homework for you this week. What are three ways your work partners with God for the flourishing of the world around us? Your job is a blessing. It's not a curse. So what are three ways your work partners with God for the flourishing of the world around us? Let's bow our heads and let's pray.